Right, we turn to our Bibles and we turn to the very last chapter of the Old Testament, the the fourth chapter of Malachi. The last chapter of the Old Testament, easy to find. And if you turn there with me, we'll read this short chapter together. Malachi chapter 4, let us hear the word of God. Surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evil doer will be stubble. And that day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. And you will go out and leap like calves released from the stall. Then you will trample down the wicked. There will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I do these things, says the Lord Almighty. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah, before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. May God bless his word to us this morning. Over the past four weeks, we've been looking together at this little book of Malachi under the title, Last Words. Because we have here God's last words to his people for some 400 years before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you attach any importance to the last words of a great politician or a trusted friend, how much more should we attach importance to these last words of our God to his people? Here are things that God wants his people to think about deeply over the coming years. Since this is our last study in the book of Malachi, let me just recap, remind you of these last words that we've looked at already. I have loved you. That was the first. Having chosen Jacob and his family, And that people, God continued to love them down to that very day. And if God had loved them, then he would keep on loving them. I have loved you. You leaders haven't set your hearts to honor me. You people have broken faith with one another and with me. That was the next last word. As God reminded his people what they were really like, despite his love for them, They had repeatedly turned from him. Return to me and I will return to you. That was last week's last word. An appeal to return to the Lord who wanted to bless them. And the last last word which we look at today concerns the day of the Lord. It's as if the Lord is saying, I'm coming You'd better be ready. You see how God has had them look back to the past and reminded them how right throughout their history he had loved them despite their repeated turnings from him. And then he made them look around at the present at how they were now treating him and he appealed to them to return so he could bless them. And now he gets them to look forward to the future by telling them there's a day coming when he will wind up things here and bring everything to a grand climax. See, God is reminding his people that he is in control of everything. And whilst they might have doubts and questions, a day is coming. The terminus of history when everything will be sorted out. Well, look with me at these verses in chapter 4, where God tells his people about that day of his coming. He tells them, first of all, what will happen on that day. 
then what he is doing about that day, and then what they should be doing about that day. First, what will happen on that day? And in verses 1 to 3, God gives them a couple of pictures to help them see it. The central feature of these pictures is the sun. And the Lord reminds them that the rising of the sun, the same sun, brings about two very different effects. First of all, the first picture, imagine the brilliant blue sky and the radiant sunshine that you might see on a Near East travel brochure. And here we are, we're out in the countryside. It's early morning. The summer months have come. There's been no rain for weeks. The land is tinder dry. The sun climbs above the horizon and begins to burn down with its terrible heat upon the stubble in the fields. Verse 1, the day burns like a furnace. It's unbearably hot. Then, as the intensity of the heat increases, with the sun's rays perhaps focused by reflecting off some distant object, suddenly the parched vegetation catches fire, blazes up, and soon the fields, as far as the eye can see, are alight. Sparks are carried, smoke billows, and the fire spreads uncontrollably, destroying everything in its path. That day, the rising sun has brought awful destruction. Here's a second picture, one that I've seen several times at home as a teenager on the farm. There's a pen of calves, born in the autumn, six or seven months old by now. They've grown well, but for all those months they've been cooped up inside in a dirty, smelly, dark shed. They've had no freedom, and now they're beginning to get cramped. It's a lovely spring day. The grass has been growing for several weeks now. Today it's particularly warm. The sun rose early, shining brightly now, and the farmer decides today he's going to let these calves out for the first time. He opens the door of the shed and stands aside. The inquisitive calves move slowly towards the open door. They poke their noses out into the fresh air. The leader, the brave one, takes the first few faltering steps off the piled up straw down onto the grass. The others follow. Their eyes take a few moments to adjust to the bright sunshine. They feel the warmth of the sun on their backs for the first time. They breathe the fresh spring air. And then something, something amazing happens. I saw it every year. They begin to leap and run around that field as if they'd gone crazy. Legs that had just been propping them up in the pen now propel them around this field. They're in their natural environment and they're enjoying it as much as calves can enjoy it. And then the two pictures are combined as the released calves go running and leaping over the ashes of the burnt out stubble. You see, the same sun has brought two very different effects. To some, it's brought delight. To others, it's brought utter destruction. And that's the Lord's picture through Malachi of the day of the Lord. That's what's going to happen. Let's fill in some details. The sun isn't the star at the center of our planetary system. It's the Son of Righteousness, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And he comes not, not shining with electromagnetic radiation, but rather radiating righteousness. He comes, we know from other parts of the Bible, to usher in a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. The wings of the sun probably refer to the sun's rays. The stubble is identified there in that passage as all the arrogance and every evildoer. And the Son of Righteousness will destroy them, root and branch. Not a root or a branch will be left to them, it says. That means that the judgment is final and irreversible. There's no root left 
to start afresh. There's no branch or shoot that can be grafted in somewhere else to start again. There's no second chance on that day. And the calves, the calves are not perfect people by any means. But they're people who honestly revere God's name. In other words, they're failing sinners who sincerely have an affection for the Lord. And that day when the Son of Righteousness bursts into the blue, they will know release and joy and happiness such as they've never known. And they'll know this because they've experienced the salvation of God who has given them a new heart, a heart which grieves over sin and which loves righteousness. And when the Lord Jesus comes, they'll witness the final defeat of all sin and evil. It'll be a day of celebration and gladness and rejoicing. They will trample down the wicked under the soles of their feet. They will leap like calves released from the stall, vexed by the injustices of the world and the remaining sin in their lives. They will find the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. may remember that there were people in Malachi's day, we read about them last week, chapter 3, verse 14, who were questioning whether or not it was worthwhile to serve God. You might be thinking that today. Is it worthwhile to be a Christian? To take up the cross and engage in a lifelong struggle with sin? Well, the word here is that it's profoundly worthwhile. This is what will happen. On the day when the Lord comes, the wicked will be destroyed. The righteous will find delight. But think of this. To whom is the Lord speaking through Malachi? Is he addressing the world which blatantly rejects him? No. Oh, the world needs that warning because it's going to be judged on that day But here, God's addressing Judah, the descendants of Jacob, the chosen people of God. You see, there are not only two kinds of people in the world, the saved and the lost. There are two kinds of people in the professed church, the saved and the lost. And when Christ returns, he'll not only judge the world, he'll judge the church. There were two kinds of people in Judah. Those who gave God insincere worship and second-rate sacrifices. We've met them already. And there were those who did their best honestly to revere God's name because they loved him. One day, the Lord says, he will judge between the two. So that's what's going to happen on that day. The final verdict will be passed. The day is coming is a very solemn last word. But it's issued by the God who'd loved them, who wanted them to return to him. And so with the warning, he goes on to tell them what he is doing about that day. Here's my second point, what God was doing about that coming day. First, it's in verse 4. He had He sent Moses with the decrees and laws for all Israel. God has already sent them Moses with the law. How does the law help to prepare people for that last day? You might be wondering. Is God saying that if they kept the law with all its commands, then they would be ready? All would be well for them? No, he's not saying that. According to the New Testament, That is not the purpose of the law at all. We could never perfectly keep the law anyway. In fact, Paul in the letter to Galatians proves that salvation has never, never been a matter of merit. We cannot earn it. We cannot earn it by our good living or by our law keeping. It was, is, and always will be a matter of God's free mercy 
a gift God gives to those who trust him. The purpose of the law is to alert people to the fact that they're sinners. That no matter how hard they try, they cannot keep God's commandments and therefore they need a saviour. This was how God's giving them the law prepared them for the last day. It was so that they'd see their need of God, their need of Christ. They'd see their sin. They'd see their failure. They'd cry out for mercy and they'd trust the promised Savior. So God had sent Moses and he'd given them the law in order to prepare them for that last day. The second thing that God was doing about that day was this. It's in verse 5. He was going to send the prophet Elijah. Now, in Matthew's Gospel, it's chapter 11, verse 14, Jesus himself says quite clearly that John the Baptist was the Elijah referred to here. In the previous chapter, chapter 3, verse 1, he is called my messenger who would prepare the way before me. Now, we know that John the Baptist prepared the way by preaching a baptism of repentance. He called on people to own up to their sin and failure without shifting the blame or pretending they were better than others. He called them to turn to Christ. He was preparing people for that day by preparing them to meet Jesus, who alone is the Savior from sin. Those who owned up to their sin would be looking to Jesus as Savior. Those who went on in the pretense and hypocrisy of being good enough for God because of their religion would reject Jesus. What was God doing about that day? Well, he was seeking to get people ready for that day. He sent Moses with the law to show them their need of a Savior. He was going to send Elijah John the Baptist, to prepare them to meet and to receive the Savior. In fact, God couldn't have done more, could he? He clearly didn't want to destroy them, as much as they deserved it. He wanted to save them. He wanted them to release them like those calves in the spring. He wanted them to know the joy and fulfillment of being in him. What a gracious God. But there's more. Not only did he warn them of the coming day, of its judgment, not only did he tell them what he was doing to get them ready, he also tells them what they should be doing about that day. And that's my third point. What they should do about that day in order to be ready. Two things again. First of all, it's in verse 4 again, They should remember the law. They should remember the law. Now, remembering the law means more than memorizing it. It means thinking about it. It means putting it into practice. Not in order to earn their salvation. They'd never be able to do that. But to show their allegiance to God. To show that they'd recognize their sin and were seeking a saviour. They were to live by the law. And then secondly, they should respond to Elijah's message, John the Baptist's message. The Lord tells us in verse 6 what John's message was all about. It was about turning the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means nothing less than a transformation of the heart resulting in love. A transformation that comes about solely by faith in Christ. In other words, they should respond to John's message by trusting into Christ. Then their hearts will be transformed. What should they be doing about that day? That great and dreadful day of the Lord? 
They should be remembering the law, going back again and again to what God had said and putting it into practice. And they should be responding to the coming messenger by trusting the one he pointed to who would transform their hearts. Only then, only then would they be safe. Otherwise, look at the end of verse 6, or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. You see, it's clear that the Lord's mind is made up. If his people persistently refuse to listen and respond, then he comes with a curse. So God's very last word in the Old Testament is that the day is coming. The day when he will return and bring things to their grand climax. We aren't told, because that is the last verse of the Old Testament, we aren't told how the people in Malachi's day responded. I guess some of them, maybe most of them, went on as if nothing had happened. Made no difference to them at all. I like to think there were some, a few perhaps, who listened, who did return to the Lord, who did begin to revere his name. But we aren't told. Perhaps as well, we aren't told so that we can't point the finger. Because, you see, this last word comes to us this morning. For some, it might. It might be the last word that you hear from this church. I don't know. But it does come to us all because that day hasn't yet come. It will. It will come. The day is coming. On that day, there will be terrible destruction for those inside and outside the church, for those who have turned their back on God, the arrogant, the evildoers. But for those who revere God's name, for those who have recognized their sin and have been cast on God's mercy, for those, there will be freedom, liberty, the joy of being at home where we belong. And still God in his grace is doing things about that day. Now. Now because he wants us to be ready. He's given us our Bibles. Our Bibles which are meant to show us our need and lead us to Christ. And he sent not only the messenger, he sent the Savior, his only Son, who can transform our hearts. What more, what more could God be doing? And still, in his grace, he tells us what we should be doing about that day in order to be ready. He tells us to remember the law, to go back to our Bibles, to read our Bibles, to study our Bibles, to let our Bibles convince us and convict us and lead us to Christ. Live by the book, he say. And he tells us, he invites us. Secondly, he invites us to respond to Christ. To trust him. To rely on him completely. To let him transform our hearts and make us new creations. Well, I need to ask you, as I ask myself, are we ready for that day of the Lord? Are we ready for the Lord's return? It's going to happen. Are we remembering the law? Are we responding to Christ in faith and in trust? If we are, 
then we can look forward expectantly to that day, that day of freedom and release and joy and fulfillment. And we can be living now in the light of it. If we aren't ready, then we really need to get ready before it's too late. Let's pray together. We thank you, Lord, for this clear warning about your return. And we thank you that you've given us the Bible and you've sent your only son to get us ready for that day. Help us, Lord, to remember the law, to be people of the book. Help us, each one, to respond to Christ in faith and trust. And let him transform our hearts. And keep us looking forward to that day of our release and our joy. Expectantly, confidently. And living now in the light of that great day. We ask our prayers. In Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 500. And 12, 512, rejoicing in hope, we wait for our king. His coming is sure, his conquest we sing. 512.